In the last tutorial, we looked at the FM matrix and briefly touched on the operator page and some of its parameters. In this video, we'll be taking a more detailed look at those parameters. To start, we'll look at the parameters of the eight standard operators. These are the ones that play single cycle waveforms such as sine, sawtooth, or square. The other operator types share most of these parameters, but also offer some specific ones needed to operate like the sample selection of the sample operator or the cutoff of a filter operator. We'll start again with a simple sound consisting of only operator 8 playing a sine wave. This should make it easier to hear the changes we make. Remember, we can initialize a layer by simply clicking on the trash can icon. First, let's talk about clicks on note start. Hear the clicks? These are especially noticeable with waveforms with low or no overtones, like a sine wave. This is because the operators are running freely, meaning their phase is not initialized to a certain value on note start. Thankfully, start phase gives us the ability to initialize the phase, and the quickest way to get rid of clicks is to set it all the way to the right at 360 degrees. So why 360 degrees and not 0 degrees? Well, when the control is turned all the way to the left, the operator is running freely and you will have a hard time nudging the start phase to just a tick above the minimum value. And since start phase operates in degrees, 360 degrees is exactly the same as 0 degrees. For certain sounds, you actually might want to click, like when emulating an analog bass drum. In that case, you can set the start phase to 90 degrees, which results in the loudest possible click, since the operator starts with the maximum amplitude. You can even adjust the strength of the click by adjusting the start phase. But you don't always want to have all operators starting at a fixed phase. If you program a sound with just a couple of slightly detuned sawtooth waveforms routed to the amp or filter, like on a typical analog or virtual analog synth, then you want them to run freely to prevent a flanging effect. This is how a sound with that fixed flanging sounds. Now let's set the two operators of this instrument to run freely. You can hear that the flanging is now quite random, as it should be when playing such a sound. Since we've just loaded a sound that uses sawtooth waveforms rather than sine waveforms, why not talk about waveforms for a second? FM comes with a couple of waveforms that can be found in classic analog synths, such as sawtooth, square, and triangle. It also offers the same digital waveforms the Yamaha TX81Z had on board. These were on board to overcome the limitations of having only four operators compared to its big brother, the DX7, which had six operators to work with. These may not sound too interesting by themselves, but they might come in handy when used as an FM modulator. The output of an operator can be inverted, which by itself doesn't do a lot, but again offers you another sound sculpting tool when working with several operators. For example, when you have two sawtooth operators like in the earlier example, and you invert the output of one operator. What you effectively achieve is pulse width modulation. Finally, Feedback can be applied to any waveform to increase its overtone content. Too much feedback quickly results in noise, which you may or may not want. You should note that the actual feedback amount depends on the level envelope. This means that the feedback amount decreases when the operator level decreases. As already mentioned in the first tutorial, one of the most important factors of an operator on an FM synth is its ratio. 
This is the factor with which the operator oscillates in relation to the bass note played on the keyboard. A ratio of 1 means it's played with the pitch of the bass note played. A ratio of 2 means that it's played twice as fast, resulting in a pitch that is one octave higher. Now to have the operator sound in two octaves higher, you need to set the ratio to 4 rather than 3. This is because we perceive a sound playing one octave higher when it plays at twice the frequency. Following this logic, when we want a sound to play one octave lower, we should set it to 0 0.5. However, all these settings have one thing in common. They track or follow the keyboard one to one when you play a melody or scale. But sometimes you want an operator to stay at a certain frequency. Or maybe you want to track with a lower amount. That's where frequency offset comes into play. To illustrate this, let's quickly switch over to the FM matrix and increase the output level of operator 7 so we can hear two operators at once. Now let's set its ratio to 0, which means that it should cease to oscillate since anything multiplied by 0 results in 0. Also, we'll set its frequency offset parameter to 263 Hz, which roughly equals the frequency of middle C. But what happens now if we play a scale? You can hear that one operator follows the keyboard as before, but the other one stays at C. Similarly, when you reintroduce the ratio, you get a partial key follow. Let's try it with a ratio of 0 0.5. Now why would all of this be useful? It might not make a lot of sense when played on its own, but it starts to become interesting when you use a secondary operator, such as an FM modulator. Granted, this is still not the best example, but let's increase the frequency offset. You can hear that it creates a strong metallic quality that sounds different for every note you play. This can be used for an electric piano sound or the attack portion of a bass or guitar sound. Now let's have some fun by making an effect sound. For this, I have set up a sound where operator 7 feeds into operator 8 at full level, and operator 7 is set to a ratio of 0 0.5 so that it oscillates one octave lower as the audible operator. Also, I have turned down operator 7's pitch LFO rate to about 200 mHz, which translates to 0 0.2 Hz, and I've selected a triangle waveform for it. Now let's hear what happens when we increase depth. Usually we'd expect to hear a slow pitch vibrato, but since we are changing an operator that modulates another operator, we hear some frequency modulation going on. Let's increase the depth further. Now let's fade it in. I don't know if this sound is useful, but it definitely sounds, um, interesting. Let's see what happens if we use the level LFO instead which is set to around 2 Hz. As you can hear, this changes the modulation depth so that the sound gets brighter and duller repeatedly. Used sparingly, this can add liveliness to a sound. Let's now take a look at the pitch and level envelope. For that, I've set up a sound with three operators where operator 6 modulates operator 7 with a ratio of 3, and operator 7 modulates operator 8 with a modulation of 0 0.5. By now, you're hopefully seeing how this FM stuff can get interesting. Since operator 7's ratio is at 0 0.5,
we will perceive the resulting sound to be one octave lower, even if the only audible operator 8 is still at ratio 1, so this sound can be used as a bass. The pitch envelope does exactly what it says. It changes the pitch of an operator. But, if it's used on an operator that itself isn't audible, it changes the frequency content of the sound. So, let's see what happens when we turn up the short pitch envelope on operator 6. As you can see, it's set to an instant attack of maximum and it decays to the centre in around 130 milliseconds. It has no release stage, so it behaves like a one-shot envelope that passes through all stages even if you release the note early. So this is how it sounds without the pitch envelope. And this happens when we slightly increase the depth. You can hear that it gets a bit scratchy, which definitely adds to the attack of this sound. And, for a change, let's increase the feedback of operator 6 to give it a few more overtones. It's quite remarkable how just a little feedback has such an effect on the sound. And finally we have the level envelope. The instrument loaded here illustrates a number of techniques, so let's go through them. First, operator 8 has a hard attack stage, but it doesn't start with a 0 millisecond attack time. Here it's set to 1 millisecond instead. This is to prevent possible clicks on note start. You could also move stage 1 manually to 1 millisecond, but there is a quicker and easier method. Let's set it back to 0 and see what happens. You may have noticed that a button labelled D-click just appeared. This button sets the attack stage to 1 millisecond to reduce clicks. This usually works sufficiently, although on very muted sounds this 1 millisecond rate might not be slow enough. If you can still hear a click on note start, Simply increase that rate to around 2 or 3 milliseconds. The level envelope of operator 7 illustrates another technique. Let's take a look using the enlarged view. You can see that the key on section of the envelope has two stages, but the release section has three, and they look a bit strange. This is to overcome an intentional limitation of the level envelopes. Their last stage is always forced to be zero, guaranteeing the operator decays to silence at some point. However, with this sound we want operator 7 to decay not to 0%, but to around 30%, so that the resulting timbre still has a lot of overtones. But, we want the operator to decay faster when we release the note, than when we hold it. You can see that stage 2, which can be seen here as the decay stage on a classic ADSR envelope, goes down to 30% in roughly 2.3 seconds. The first release stage, however, goes down to 30% in roughly 700 milliseconds. So, when we play a note and quickly release it, the timbre becomes duller in around that time. But then what? Perhaps we want it to stay there rather than go to 0%. This is achieved by stage 4, which holds that level for 60 seconds, which is plenty of time for the sound to die away completely. And the final stage 5 just goes to 0% as it has to. Let's now switch over to operator 6 while we're still in the enlarged level envelope view. Here you can see a similar setup, but since I decided not to have different decay and release phases, the envelope can be set up simpler. As you can see, the sustain and stages values are the same, which means that there is no dedicated release phase, but the envelope just goes through all of its stages no matter when you release the note. Hence, we only need to set up a single decay stage in this case stage 2, to go from maximum down to around 20%. And since we want to stay at this 20% level, we can add a stage that lasts for 60 seconds with the same level. The sound eventually comes to an end, courtesy of a final stage that takes it down to zero. Thanks for making it through to the end of the video. I realise we covered quite a lot in a short space of time, and yet, we've still barely scratched the surface of FM. Nevertheless, I hope you are now beginning to form a clearer understanding of FM synthesis in general, and of this synth in particular. Let's see what the next tutorial brings.